Hi, uh, my name is Karen Moffitt, and on behalf of Dr. Noel Chan, we are the co-coordinators for the Hematology and Thromboembolism Grand Round. We welcome you to the 2021-2022 round session. We would acknowledge, or we acknowledge that McMaster University sits on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations and is within the land protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. We have a number of excellent speakers for today's round and they will be discussing anti-PF4 disorders and I will hand over the microphone to Dr. Working team, Workington and team. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, Karen. So it's uh, always a delight to give uh, HEME rounds. And of course, the inaugural rounds of the uh, academic year is a, is a special treat. And so what we thought we would do is to talk about antiplatelet factor four disorders, HIT, VIT, etc., and focus on McMaster's contributions to this novel disorder, VIT, and in a very important public health matter. And as you can see, there's a number of uh, contributors to this talk today. So what are our contributions? Well, we have a role in several of the key papers that have come out. The McMaster Lab, which uh, Dr. Arnold will talk about, has had a huge role in, in VIT diagnosis in Canada. The very consequential Nature paper that came out uh, about a month ago. And also our residents have gotten involved recognizing interesting uh, VIT cases and publishing them. And also the scientific communication with respect to VIT by uh, Menica Pai, really directing the thinking for the province of Ontario through Science Testing. Table Advisory. So some very important roles by McMaster on this topic. Now I'm gonna call this disorder VIT, vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia. There are some other names, VIP, TTS, et cetera. And one of the reasons is I like VIT as a mnemonic, as a memory device. After all, you get the vaccine, and mo most implicated are the AstraZeneca and J&J Janssen vaccines. Then there's an immune reaction, so that implies an interval, which is generally between five and 30 days, occasionally a little bit later. The patient then presents with thrombosis, because after all, these are otherwise generally healthy people that are not getting platelet count monitoring, they've just got their vaccine. So they present with thrombosis, uh, usually a week or two after the uh, vaccination. And then as part of working up, the thrombosis, you recognize the thrombocytopenia, which is a big clue to the presence of VIT. So here's the first paper that came out on April the 9th. And notice that right in the conclusions that VIT is, a, is caused by platelet activating antibodies against platelet factor four, PF4. So uh, how, did, how did that all happen? And how was that figured out? And what was McMaster's role? So the index case was actually a nurse in Austria who got the AstraZeneca vaccine and then developed cerebral vein sinus thrombosis, so let's call it CVT, and profound thrombocytopenia and a DIC state. And the sample was sent to the, to the Greinacher lab in Germany, in Greifswald, Germany, and the PF4 ELISA was strongly positive, but the functional test, which is like our serotonin release assay, was completely <laughs> And so the question arose, how could this be? And so Andreas Greinacher and I talked about this and we wondered, well, would adding PF4 make a difference to the assay? And there's some precedence for that. So for example, Isaac Nazi and, and in Kelton's group a few years ago showed and, and developed an assay uh, with Jim Smith being uh, the main uh, laboratory technologist developing this where the SRA is performed rather than adding heparin, adding platelet factor four. And it turns out this is a, a useful assay that makes it easier to detect anti-PF4 platelet activating antibodies. And we, and we, as well as others, have also contributed to the concept of so-called SRA negative HIT. These are patients who appear to be HIT clinically, have a strong positive ELISA, but are not positive in the conventional SRA, but are positive when you supplement with PF4. Now, don't be worried. This doesn't mean our assay doesn't work. In fact, this is a very uncommon occurrence in our SRA sensitivity, even taking into account so-called SRA negative hit is still in the, in the very high 90s. Uh, but the concept is that addition of PF4 can enhance the detection of platelet activating any PF4 antibodies. That's the concept that's emerged in the hit field in the last few years. So now getting back to, 
to vit. So what Greinacher showed is that a number of these vit sera showed some degree of platelet activation just in the presence of buffer. And when you supplemented PF4, then the antibodies were readily detectable. So the concept is that this syndrome VIT is caused by strong platelet activating anti-PF4 antibodies, but you need to sometimes add the PF4 in the assay to be able to detect them. So that raises the whole issue of what are the, the PF4 disorders and, and what's the central theme of PF4? Why is this such an important protein in explaining these? Well, platelet factor four is a highly cationic or positively charged tetrameric protein that has, as shown by the blue amino acids, lysine and arginine, the so-called ring of positive charge. And because it's tetrameric, the identical antigen sites, you know, at least two can be present, say, at the top and the bottom of the molecule. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because an immune response could simultaneously bind to two antigens on the same protein, which leads to the potential for an IgG PF4 IgG immune complex. And if you then bring in heparin and multiple PF4s, you can create this massively large immune complex that can directly activate platelets. So that's kind of why PF4 is a special molecule. And so what are the four platelet activating activating any PF4 syndromes with this classic hit. There's this atypical variant called autoimmune hit, I'll, I'll say a few words about. There's the spontaneous hit syndrome, which is an anti-PF4 disorder not triggered by heparin. It's been recognized for about a dozen years or so. And then of course, the novel disorder, VIT, vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia. So you're all familiar with classic hit. This is a post-heart surgery patient who develops the unexpected platelet count fall about six days after heart surgery, died of a fatal pulmonary embolism, has a strong uh, positive SRA, and you can see it's a heparin-dependent uh, antibody response, and the patient tested strongly positive in a PF4 heparin ELISA, or enzyme immunoassay. And so, you know, conceptually, the reason why HIT is so distinct and different from drug ITP is shown on the left. Drug ITP, of course, has profound thrombocytopenia and uh, bleeding, usually cutaneous bleeding. HIT, by contrast, has moderate degree of thrombocytopenia and is very high risk, about 75% of thrombosis. And the reason why these two disorders are so distinct is ITP, you're basically clearing the platelet through the macrophage FC receptors. So it's kind of benign, but very profound platelet clearance. You know, every platelet's got glycoprotein 2B3, so they're all a targeted. Whereas, whereas um, the HIT reaction being a platelet activation response, there's a lot of heterogeneity and platelet activation to responses. And uh, so you see a more moderate degree of thrombocytopenia, but conceptually you create in situ platelet activating PF4, IgG, and in the case of HIT, heparin immune complexes that are profoundly platelet activating. So it's a fundamentally different immune reaction than say drug ITP. Now, what about autoimmune HIT? So this reflects a variant of rather severe HIT syndromes called delayed onset HIT, persisting or refractory HIT, heparin flush HIT, and even the, the few cases of fondaparinix HIT. They have this pattern. And what happens is unlike heparin-dependent antibodies, as shown on the right, you have this heparin-independent platelet-activating property where the patient's serum causes strong serotonin release even in the absence of heparin. This is the, 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 the fundamental picture of so-called autoimmune HIT syndromes. And just to give you a quick example of what this looks like clinically, here's a patient who had heart surgery, was discharged on post-operative day six, so I'm getting no heparin after leaving hospital. About 10 days later, the family doctor notices this platelet count of 61, gets referred to heart surgery, who confirms it and orders a HIT test, and it's recognized the patient has actually pulmonary embolism, and this entire post-operative, pretty dramatic thrombocenic process is all related to strong HIT antibodies. This patient was treated with fondaparinix and rivaroxaban, and it took about two to three months before the platelet count eventually got back to the patient's usual range. And when we looked at this case serologically, we found the patient had a strong positive serotonin release as shown by the heparin dependent serotonin release shown on the top. But look what happened when we looked at the heparin independent serotonin release, that is the reaction of buffer control at zero units per mole heparin. You can see that there was a beautiful inverse relationship between the gradual decline in the heparin independent platelet activating property and the increase 
in the platelet counts, showing that this heparin independent reactivity is fundamental to explaining the onset of the thrombocytopenia as well as the persistence and gradual waning of the thrombocytopenia. So now a few words about the third uh, PF4 syndrome, so-called spontaneous hit syndrome. Well, this is defined as a patient who presents with thrombocytopenia and almost always thrombosis, who has detectable anti-PF4 platelet activating antibodies, and importantly, has no proximate heparin exposure to explain the presence of said anti-PF4 antibodies. So that's the concept. And the first uh, two reports uh, appeared uh, 13 years ago in 2008, and there are actually two variants out there. There's the post-orthopedic surgery, the so-called knee replacement variant of spontaneous hit syndrome. And here we think there's something about the knee replacement, the tourniquet, the accumulation of cellular debris, you know, poly polyanines like RNA, et cetera, that get released when the tourniquet is released. Perhaps that's triggering rarely this uh, profound anti-PF4 immune response that looks a lot like HIT. And then there's the other variant, which we call the medical spontaneous hit syndrome, which is usually after an infection, viral, bacterial, et cetera. Now, a very interesting finding, and this was made by um, Greinacher and I just recently when we did a review of all the cases of spontaneous hit syndrome we could find in the literature, both the post-orthopedic variant and the medical variant. What we found is the medical variant, which is extraordinarily rare, there are only 11 cases we could find in the literature, it turns out that most of them developed stroke, including cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, CVST, or, or sometimes abbreviated CVT. And a, and a few had arterial stroke. And overall, 64% of patients who developed, who developed spontaneous hit syndrome developed uh, stroke, especially venous stroke. So very, very interesting picture. And of course, that's relevant because of the clinical picture of VIT. So let's talk about VIT. Well, VIT is kind of a kind of severe hit. That is, the median platelet count is more in the 40,000 range versus the typical 60,000 range for HIT. And the proportion of thrombosis, rather than being around 70, 75% like HIT, is more in the 95 to approaching 100% range. So median platelet count of about 40, very high rate of thrombosis. Now, the, the male-female frequency appears to be approximately, you know, a little, little, slightly female predominant, perhaps. And in the UK data, where the broad swath of the British population was vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine, the age group is about what you'd expect in the population being vaccinated broadly. In terms of its onset, it's usually recognized approximately two weeks after vaccination, with the range being between days five to occasionally after day 30. The latest case so far reported is day 48. And if you look at the thrombotic events, there it is, CVST or cerebral hemorrhage, which is, of course, a common way that CVST presents as cerebral hemorrhage, is the most common complication of VIT with standard VTE or abdominal vessel, so-called splanchnic vein and adrenal vein thrombosis, uh, also occurring in a significant number of patients, and more boring MIs and arterial strokes occurring as well, as well as patients who have multiple site thrombosis. Now, before we uh, uh, go on in the talk, I want to make a, a, an interesting observation. So despite spontaneous HIT syndrome being quite rare, there's some very dramatic clinical vignettes in the literature, and one of them is the use of high-dose IVIG to treat spontaneous HIT syndrome. And here's an example of a post-orthopedic surgery spontaneous HIT. This is a patient who uh, underwent knee arthroplasty in the United States, had aspirin prophylaxis thereafter, presented on day um, 12 with abdominal pain, was found to have splanchnic vein thrombosis. And what happened is this patient was treated with high-dose IVIG given right there when the platelet count was about 20, and very rapidly, over three days, rose to 200. An extraordinarily rapid uh, platelet count increase, way beyond what you generally see in spontaneous hit syndrome. But also, these samples were referred to our lab. We showed that the patient's heparin-independent uh, platelet activating property was inhibited dramatically right after getting the high dose IVIG. So this supports the concept that high dose IVIG inhibits platelet activating properties of these um, uh, spontaneous hit antibodies. So now going to the treatment of VIT, the concept is 
to use anticoagulation, of course, and generally because it mimics HIT, the recommendations are to use a non-heparin agent, though that may not be, um, may not actually be correct. Perhaps heparin would work fine to use high dose IVIG upfront and for refractory cases to go to plasma exchange. And the reason why you know, heparin might actually be effective is if you go to the Greinacher paper, uh, he actually showed that most vitsera are actually inhibited by heparin um, in, in pharmacologic concentrations, a point that uh, uh, Professor Nazi will, will address later in his seg segment of the presentation. All right, so now I wanna talk about one of the McMaster contributions to this important treatment concept, which is use of adjunct immune globulin, so high dose IVIG to treat vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And the reason why the word adjunct is there is because of course you need to use anticoagulation, right? These patients have thrombosis, they require anticoagulation, but you need to cool off the intense hypercoagulability state, the DIC. Plus, a lot of physicians are reluctant to use therapeutic dose anticoagulation if the patient's plate the count is 20 or 30. So besides cooling the syndrome off, it also raises the platelet count, which helps the clinician want to, want to give uh, anticoagulation. And so in our paper, um, we reported uh, three, the first three VIT cases in Canada, and uh, we, we showed that the IVIG does work. It raises the platelet count quickly. So here's the first, second, third, fourth dose of IVIG, and you can see the platelet count rising quickly. In addition, along with anticoagulation, the D-dimer is going down. So it's not, the IVG is not contributing to hypercoagulability. It appears to help uh, lessen it. And similarly, the fibrinogen increase, these are US units. So in Canadian units, 2.2 grams per liter is going up to almost five grams per liter during the treatment with IVIG and uh, fondaparinex. Now, sometimes patients can become refractory in the case I'm showing you, did actually develop recurrent thrombocytopenia. And later on, we this was the one of the three patients we did use uh, plasma exchange later on. But actually this patient's, you know, hypercoagulability state did come under control even with the recurrence of the thrombocytopenia thereafter. So in our paper, we concluded that the patients appear to respond to IVIG. Importantly, we found no decrease in ELISA reactivity. So the ELISA reactivity stayed the same. In other words, the IVIG is not blocking the ability of the VID antibodies to recognize the antigen, the PF4 dependent antigen. However, we did find with all uh, three patients, and here are the data for patient three, that after the first and then second and third and fourth doses of IVIG, you can see that there was progressive decrease in the uh, platelet activating properties by the uh, VID antibodies. And so this directly supports the concept that IVIG works by inhibiting platelet activation through the platelet FC receptors. In fact, you can show this in vitro. If you just add PF4, uh, sorry, if you just had IVIG directly with lots of PF4, you can completely inhibit the VID antibody induced activation. So this is not only an ex vivo phenomenon where you study blood taken from patients, it's an in vitro phenomenon where you can directly inhibit the platelet uh, activating properties of the VID sera in the serotonin release assay. So a very attractive concept for showing and really proving that IVIG does ameliorate the VIT reaction. All right, before turning the talk over to Dr. Arnold, who's going who's gonna to take over now, I just want to make a point that the technologists, um, I show a couple there, uh, I showed Jim and Jane, because believe it or not, they've been uh, here at McMaster longer than I have. And I also show there on the left, on the bottom right picture, Joanne, who's been my long-term uh, uh, tech research technologist working with me. Just the idea that, you know, they're not working from home. They're doing the testing. We've had as many hit cases as ever. We, of course, got the new VIT samples coming. You can see from the PF4 dependent SRA that it's more complex testing. So not only more samples, more complex testing and going into work every day. It's, uh, it's been extraordinary um, 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 performance and role of our technologists. All right. So Donnie, I'm going to stop share and sign over to you. Thanks, Ted. Um, I hope this is coming through okay. I've just uh, taken over sharing my slides in presentation mode. <clears throat> um, Ted has done a great job at, uh, in a very short period of time, explaining a 
totally brand new disease that had, had occurred kind of without any warning during COVID vaccination. So, that, um, and this was something that, uh, you know, we had to learn on our feet very quickly. Um, it, I guess it was a lot of um, good, good fortune in a way or luck really that uh, our lab happened to be doing um, testing for what was up until now a very niche disease that's heparin induced thrombocytopenia. We had uh, figured out a way to um, improve some of the assays that Ted mentioned to, you know, to make it more sensitive, perhaps by adding PF4 as a reagent. But lo and behold, um, this VIT syndrome comes about. And um, as it turns out, the platelet immunology lab at McMaster is really the only lab in Canada that was uh, able to provide testing for this disorder. So almost generically, we became the reference lab for other centers in Canada who were all struggling with this at around the exact same time uh, as AstraZeneca vaccine was being rolled out. Um, it wasn't long, um, a few months later, that uh, we became recognized as the VIT testing reference laboratory for Canada by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And we were very proud to uh, do that. And we continue to test uh, the, uh, what samples come in from across the country and, as I'll explain in a minute, in, with collaborating countries as well. So uh, the part, portion of my talk here, literally about five minutes or so, is just to tell you about our experience with VIT testing in our laboratory. I'm not going to go into the science, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the demographics. Um, and a lot of this uh, data is thanks to Kayla Lucier, who I'll mention at the end, who's become the VIT coordinator essentially for our research or our program. So we have tested 218 patients in our lab for VIT. Um, the, the, the positivity rate was 21.6%, so 47 <clears throat> positive VIT tests out of that, out of that um, population. There were certainly more samples than that that have come through, so 299 samples, and that's because we've done some repeat sampling on uh, a number of patients who've tested positive, <clears throat> as Ted has shown, and um, of that group, 26% uh, were positive. And when I say positive, this is defined as being positive in the anti-PF4 ELISA, uh, usually very strongly positive with OD levels uh, close to or over two, um, and positive in the functional assay, which is, as, as described, is a PF4 functional platelet activation assay plus with the addition uh, of PF4, SRA, typical SRA with the addition of PF4. <clears throat> what, are those, what do the patients look like that we tested? So, in fact, in, in, our, in our cohort, it's actually slightly male predominant, um, and the age is about 57 uh, as a median. Here's the breakdown for the vaccine types that people had received. And if you look at the first column, this is all patients. The second column is positive VIT patients or positive VIT samples. So if we focus on the positive VIT, um, 40 or 85% of the um, positive tests came from patients who had received AstraZeneca. Uh, two were labeled as COVID, COVID shield, which is essentially also the AstraZeneca vaccine. So that's pretty much the same. We have two samples that were positive in, uh, from D Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And uh, those were people who were either in the U.S. and got the vaccine and then ended up back in Canada or samples sent directly from the U.S. And I'll bring your attention to one Pfizer um, it's hard to know what this means, but there's one, one um, sample that tested positive for VIT in a patient who had received the Pfizer vaccine. And as part of this, um, you know, investigation, we do a lot of uh, legwork. So, you know, I make phone calls to these docs and find out all the details of what happened to that patient. It looked like in this case, the only vaccine they had received with Pfizer and the clinical presentation was actually very severe, um, could have easily been VIT, but in, you know, it, it's possibly that it could have been other things too. There's one report in the literature of a mRNA vaccine associated VIT, um, but there again, there's some skepticism as to whether or not that is true. <clears throat> 
But by and large, the take-home message is this is a syndrome that only happens with the adenoviral vector vaccines. Um, for us, it's AstraZeneca because that's all that we've been using. And even in the U.S., where Johnson & Johnson, another adenoviral vector vaccine is being used, it's far less common with, with that particular vaccine as well. Here's just a sample of how our uh, distribution of uh, samples that we've received over the months. So certainly May and April were the busiest months for us. And you can imagine as, as has been discussed, this is a lab that is fairly small and we're doing a niche area testing for HIT. All of a sudden the lab technologists and staff are being bombarded with three, four, five times the amount of work that they're normally doing. But uh, kudos to them that they were able to pull this off and do it with uh, such finesse. By June and July, the numbers started tapering off. August, uh, even less, we're still getting a few. And, and I am happy to say that we are collaborating with other countries for where AstraZeneca is the main type of vaccine that they're continuing to get. And, and they are gonna be um, faced with this problem ongoing. The red uh, of this map shows you where our samples are coming from, essentially all over Canada, um, some parts of the US. And I've mentioned again, our collaboration with Brazil, I anticipate that we will start seeing an increase in the samples coming to us because Brazil, Brazil is so big and AstraZeneca is the main type of vaccine that uh, is being used there. Um, again, some shout outs to the people who have made this happen. There's Kayla over on the left. Uh, she's really become the bit coordinator for this initiative. Uh, Jim and Jane, uh, who many of you know, and. Uh, Mercy and Anna, who are, are both students in our lab, have done a lot of work at pulling together all these results. Um, this has gained some attention uh, provincially, for sure. We were very uh, honored to host Premier Ford um, taking a tour of our lab. That's um, Premier Ford, the health minister, and the minister of, of universities and colleges all coming through our lab um, to see the work that we were doing and, and hear about some of the results. And that was a real treat. And what was even more fun is that he actually gave me his personal cell phone and said, good job. If you need anything, let me know. And here's the proof of that. So I sent him a quick note to say, a pleasure hosting you. Um, come back anytime. Here's a picture. And he even wrote me back. So if anyone needs any favors done, let me know. I'll see what, what, what strings I could pull for you. Anyways, um, that's it. I'm going to stop my, sh my screen share and uh, send it over to Isaac to tell you about some really exciting science that has come out of this as well. Thanks, Donnie. All right, I'm hoping this uh, shows up well. Can you guys, can everybody see it? That's good. Excellent. Thank you. All right, so uh, my name is uh, Isaac Nazi, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University, and I'm also the scientific director of the Platelet Immunology Lab, where um, all this work that uh, Ted and uh, Donnie and I'm going to talk about takes place. Uh, my section is pretty much I'm going to talk about how we spent uh, very few months, I think about three to four months, in understanding the disease mechanism that leads to the clotting events uh, following vaccination with uh, the adenoviral vector vaccines. And at first it really appeared that we were so fortunate and we were so lucky in uh, the fact that this work fell into our lab. But the reality is, you know, the country was fortunate, maybe the world was fortunate that we were this prepared. So this takes me back to this uh, this uh, saying by Thomas Jefferson, I'm a great believer in luck and I find the harder I work, the luckier I get. And I'm not referring to myself for sure. I'm referring to the Playlet Immunology Lab where all this work happens. And I'm actually starting my talk by, by saying how important they were in um, not only in the COVID related adenoviral vector uh, clotting events, but also in the COVID immunity testing and studying and COVID clotting and VIT diagnosis and these people have worked around the clock, uh, sweat, blood and tears. And uh, I, don't, I don't know that anybody knows how hard they did work. So my, I tip my hat to them. They are an incredible group of people. Um, and, the, and all the work I'm gonna show right now is, is a product of their uh, um, efforts. Uh, our, our, and I say we were very prepared and it's because 
um, along the along the lines of doing diagnostic testing for all these diseases, uh, especially heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, we do science. And several years ago, we developed an assay that Ted spoke about. It's the uh, PF4 dependent SRA, and basically we developed that so we don't miss the one to five percent of SRA negative hits. And we shelved that. We used it for a few studies. We compared it to other PF4 dependent uh, functional assays worldwide, and there's a lot of work being done there but it wasn't that important at the time. Lo and behold, and the onset of the clotting events that happened uh, around the world, uh, this, uh, this or variations of this assay became the gold standard for confirmatory diagnosis of VIT. Also, what uh, had us prepared is this unbelievable rock star of a scientist, she was, uh, Ange Dr. Angela Wynn. She was a PhD student in our lab she moved on to pursue an unbelievable career also in medicine. With the onset of the pandemic, Angela decided that, well, there's no school uh, on campus. So she decided she'll do two things at the same time, go to medical school and um, publish an HR paper. <laughs> so that's what Angela did. But a few years ago, while she was doing her PhD in our lab, she developed a technology called alanine scanning mutagenesis. And basically what this, uh, technology is, is you take a protein and you mutate every single um, amino acid in the protein. So you develop multiple versions of this uh, protein. And you, when, you when you change an amino acid, you affect the binding of the antibody to it. So in platelet factor four, which is 70 amino acids, she made 70 versions of the uh, protein with every single amino acid mutated to alanine. And if it was an alanine, she mutated to a valine. So you change functional groups on the protein, which affect the binding. So if an antibody relies on a specific amino acid to bind, then it won't bind anymore. It will have decreased binding. And she did a PhD using that so she can understand the different types of antibodies in HIT. She's published a lot of nice papers that explained HIT, um, such as these, uh, th these uh, figures. So in the A panel, you have two monoclonal antibodies called KKO and 5D9. They have binding characteristics to PF4. And what she was able to do uh, it was map them. And it shows you the area on PF4 where these map to. And at the B, in the B uh, panel, you see uh, the epitope mapping of different types of hits, including patients who have who are suspected of HIT but never actually activate platelets and don't have HIT on the far right. And you can see how it's all focused in one section, which is similar to KKO and 5B9, those monoclonal antibodies that behave like HIT. Now, on her way out of the lab, literally the last week when she did finish her PhD, she decided to, ma to, to map another monoclonal antibody in collaboration with uh, Dr. Yves Gruel from France. This is 1E12 on the top right of this uh, picture. And you can see 1E12, which actually behaves differently in the functional assays. It doesn't need heparin to activate. It maps in a region distant, distant from the region that we noticed KKO and 5B9 and all our hits map. When we look closer at this, we found that it actually maps to an area where the heparin binds PF4. Of course, Angela was on her way out, so we shelved that and we didn't think about it again. Fast forward to COVID clotting events, and we, had, we have weekly VIT meetings and COVID meetings in our war room with Dr. Kelton, Dr. Arnold, Jim, Jane, and our entire VIT slash COVID crew. In our war room, we were talking about how, you know, when Dr. When Dr. Greinacher and Marie Scully and, and the, the, the rest of the investigators in Europe came up with their uh, 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 papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, it became apparent that heparin is, might be interfering with the binding of these antibodies. So in our war room, we're talking about this. And of course, Angela and I went back to her 1E12 map where it binds to heparin. And we took a bold statement in that room and we said, I bet the antibodies bind to the heparin site and act like 1E12. So sure enough, she used her alanine scanning mutagenesis with the 70 different PF4 mutants and she screened five, our first five consecutive VIT samples. And when she mapped them, she came up with what you see here. On the top left, where it says uh, VIT, uh, she used five different patients and they mapped 
to the exact same site that 1E12 mapped to and the heparin binding site, which you see in B. They overlap. In fact, she identified eight amino acids that were restricted to these uh, bit samples, kind of telling us that it is a limited clonality, B cell clonality. Out of the eight amino acids, four of them were identical to the ones that heparin uses to bind on PF4. This is slightly in contrast to what you see in the HIT patients, because when we took 10 HIT patients, we identified two different things. One, some of the HIT patients will exclusively have antibodies that bind to a site that is distant from the heparin site. And it's actually the same site as we saw for KKO on 5B9. Another set of HIT patients, were, which, which are uh, regularly known as autoimmune HIT patients, those have two sites, the KKO binding site, which we saw earlier on the North Pole in blue, and the red heparin binding site. But none of the HIT patients actually have, that we tested, actually have exclusively antibodies that bind the heparin binding site. So this phenomena of HIT, of binding only the heparin site, started to indicate to us why this disease can actually progress without heparin. And of course, when you look at these uh, uh, different uh, patient populations, the top in red being uh, VIT samples, the bottom in blue being HIT samples, using on the left heparin-dependent SRA and on the right PF4-dependent SRA, this is seen in other publications too, that the VIT antibodies don't really work in the heparin-dependent serotonin functional assay, which is serotonin release functional assay. They need PF4 to activate for the majority. In contrast to HIT patients who will activate in the presence of heparin and of course in the presence of PF4. When we took these five samples, or four out of the five, as you can see here, and we, we, we looked into whether heparin really can inhibit their binding in an, in an ELISA-based assay, and sure enough, you can see that at therapeutic doses of heparin, you abolish any antibody binding. This is in contrast to uh, HIT patients, because HIT patients, uh, when you put them in the EIA, you can actually inhibit their binding to PF4 with the presence of heparin, except you need high levels of heparin to do that. So it actually depends on heparin for binding. So, in, so, so now we know the antibodies in VIT actually bind to the heparin site. So it kind of tells us that, yeah, maybe the antibody can actually complex PF4 on its, the VIT antibody, sorry, can complex PF4 on its own without heparin because it binds that site and, you know, to create those aggregates. However, the question became, do they have enough binding ability, binding strength to hold on to the PF4s long enough so that they can keep those aggregates formed and activate platelets? So we use a technology called biolayer interferometry, which can, tell, which can measure how strongly and, uh, two proteins can bind to each other, and in this case, how strongly the antibodies can bind to the PF4 molecules. And without going into a lot of detail, this is, this is just the experimental data right here. You can see in C and D, when we use PF4 and PF4 heparin as the antigen for antibody binding, the VIT antibodies had higher antibodies, uh, antibody binding to PF4 and PF4 heparin than actual HIT antibodies. So they seem to be uh, uh, able to bind better than HIT. There is a drop in binding between PF of the, of the VIT antibodies between PF4 and PF4 heparin, as you can see uh, uh, between panel C and D. And that was obviously explained because of the competitive nature between the antibodies and heparin for the binding of VIT. In E and D measures something called dissociation rate constant. And basically it tells you how long an antibody can be stuck to its protein or a protein-protein interaction, how long they can be stay stuck to each other. And what we also did show here is that the dissociation rate was uh, pretty, pretty slow, which meant the antibodies can stick onto the antigen long enough. And of course, the, uh, the VIT antibodies were just as good as the HIT antibodies sticking to the antigen and, and uh, staying on there. So everything, all indications now told us that the VIT, VIT antibodies can bind to PF4 at the site where heparin binds, which meant that they can aggregate, they could possibly aggregate PF4. They also bound with enough strength to hold on to the PF4 that can keep this complex going. Um, <clears throat> so we were excited about that. We figured that that would be the reason the immune complexes are forming. However, from our knowledge and hit, we know that a lot of immune complexes 
are formed on the surface of a platelet or another cell. Um, so none of this work right here was a complete indication that these complexes can form in fluid phase and activate uh, platelets. And it could be that it's, it's still done on the surface of a platelet or in the fluid phase. But the last evidence that we got is to show whether these antibodies can actually show us that they can uh, create these immune complexes. And the data right here shows that, I don't know if you, if, if everybody can see my cursor, but the one, two, three, the fourth column is PF4 with VIT antibodies. And you can see the second one, PF4 is with heparin. It can form aggregates as measured by the diameter of the, the, the blob that is formed. And you can see PF4 heparin, which we know form complexes, form about uh, 300, uh, um, the diameter is about 300 nanometers. When you compare that to the VIT antibodies with PF4 in the fourth column, you can see that the antibodies can form um, complexes as large as PF4 heparin complexes on their own. So this was the nail in the coffin that told us, yes, these antibodies can form immune complexes without the presence of heparin. So in summary, what you can see here is a schematic of what we think the PF4 and VIT antibodies can do uh, the antibodies bind to the heparin site with enough strength to aggregate PF4, which can go on to bind uh, platelets at the FC receptor, causing platelet activation and potentially the thrombotic events that follow uh, the vaccination with the COVID uh, um, adenoviral vector vaccines. Uh, that's the end of my slides. Um, I, I thank the group for uh, inviting me to give this part of the talk. It's been a, a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Life lessons, scientific lessons. Uh, thanks, Ted, for asking us to join you in this talk. Um, and, I, and my biggest thanks is to Dr. Kelton, Dr. Arnold, and the Playlet Immunology Lab for all the incredible work they have actually put together in the last 18 months. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. So we just down to our very, very last slides. Now here we're going to try a little experiment. So Sarah and Nadia, I'm hoping one of you will be able to unmute and uh, tell us about you, your recognizing on the front lines the, the cases. So uh, that's All right. Work, so. There, so hi, I'm Sarah Patterson. I am a hematologist who's working as a locum, I guess, and involved in the sickle cell care. And I'd like to take you briefly through the first of our two VIT patients that I picked up while working at St. Joe's. Our first patient was a 68-year-old gentleman who got his vaccine on April the 5th, so that's his day zero. Uh, he presented on May 9th, um, which was day 33, with a three-day history of left leg swelling. Um, he was quite uncomfortable with this. There were some issues when he initially presented to urgent care with his D-dimer being misreported um, due to an issue with the lab uh, at that time. So he got brought back the next day for an ultrasound um, where we saw him in emerge. He had a very extensive left lower limb DVT as listed below. Uh, and he had a, some mild thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of 116. He didn't meet the textbook cases of VIT, but we were wondering, you know, given the timeline with the vaccine, he'd had sort of a flu-like illness for a week or two at the time of his vaccine, and then this leg swelling, uh, we decided that, you know, common things being common, we should do the assay. Unfortunately, he actually left the emergency room before we were able to do this blood work, despite knowing that we were coming to assess him formally. So we weren't able to actually do the assay until May 12th when I brought him back to clinic. At that time, his VIT antibodies were positive. As you can see, he had positivity in the enzyme-linked uh, immunoassay, uh, as well as positivity in the serotonin-released assay, only when you added the extra PF4, um, as was seen consistent with VIT, based on the other um, information we had. Uh, he was treated with IVIG. Um, he did have to be brought back for that because, again, he had gone home while we were waiting for the results. Um, so that happened on um, in May, on May 15th. Uh, he was, uh, he responded really well to therapy and he had a, a good response with a repeat uh, immunoassay. 
that was still positive, but he did have uh, the SRA became negative despite the addition of PF4 antibodies, which we feel is consistent with a response to uh, the IVIG. Uh, he was started on a Pixivan, as you can see below, uh, when we initially saw him in the emergency room. Uh, he has had uh, an improvement in his D-dimer through this time, which is associated with uh, response to uh, therapy and, and reduction in his hypercoagulability. He's an interesting uh, gentleman because he does have uh, persistent thrombocytopenia. Um, he actually dropped his platelets again in June uh, down to 112, um, at which time we did repeat some blood work uh, including his uh, immunoassay at that time. Uh, his ELISA was still positive, but his SRA remained negative, uh, and he did ultimately get some more IVIG, but has recovered um, back to his platelets of 136 to 137. He doesn't have a baseline recently, um, which makes it interesting to see where he's um, coming from, but he is feeling much better. He never had any symptoms of clot aside from his DVT, uh, and he has actually been vaccinated now uh, with an mRNA vaccine, which he seemed to have tolerated very well in September. So that's our first VIT case. I'll hand over to Dr. Gabaran, who'll tell you about case number two. Thank you. Um, I was on my junior attending uh, rotation at the time when we had uh, these cases. So this is our second case at St. Joe's. Uh, he developed some dyspnea on exertion on day 11 post AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, just was monitoring his symptoms at home, though his wife really wanted him to, to go in for assessment. And it wasn't until he developed some small volume hemoptysis on day 15 that he presented to the, to the emergency department. So at that time, he was found to have a platelet count of 103. Uh, that's on the background of a pre-vaccination platelet count of 265. And he had a D-dimer above 20 milligrams per liter. Uh, given the clinical presentation, a CTPA was performed, he had an extensive bilateral PE involving the left and right main pulmonary arteries with saddle embolism. He also had uh, on Doppler ultrasound a left lower limb DVT involving the superficial femoral vein with extension into the popliteal vein. Uh, he was hemodynamically stable throughout all of this and uh, did not have any evidence of right heart strain. He was admitted to hospital and started on rivaroxaban 15 BID. Uh, given the clinical presentation, the ELISA and SRA testing were sent and the anti-PF4 ELISA was positive. Uh, the patient serum induced uh, serotonin release only with the addition of uh, PF4. And so given this clinical, clinical constellation, um, uh, he met criteria for a diagnosis of VIT, so he was started on IVIG one gram per kilogram uh, daily for two days, which he received on days 17 and 18 post-vaccine, and had a resultant increase in his platelet count. Similar to the other cases presented today, uh, post-IVIG, the ELISA remained positive, and the serotonin release assay became negative. His D-dimer continued to decrease on this treatment, uh, demonstrating the efficacy of the combination of IVIG and anticoagulation in reducing the hypercoagulability of VIT. And at last follow-up, he remained clinically well with no recurrence of thrombosis or thrombocytopenia. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Workington and thank you for including us in the rounds today. Okay, well, thank you both uh, Sarah and Nadia. So. Obviously, what's cool is there's recognition of a problem, and then in the front lines, clinicians are recognizing these cases. And so that raises the issue of communication. So basically, this is the last, uh, the last slide or two of the presentation. I want to highlight the work of Menica Pai, who's been the leader in the communication within Ontario. So she sits on the so-called science table with a number of um, with uh, engaged clinicians with various domains of expertise. And she's been involved in the communication response, both in articles for clinicians, but also for informing the politicians, as well as the lay community about all sorts of COVID issues, including the uh, VITT. 
reaction. So here's a couple of uh, examples of uh, communications. And, and it's, after all, if we do science work in a, in a, in a vacuum and, and people don't know what we're doing, that, that's not very helpful. So, so kudos to Menica and perhaps during the Q&A, she might want to uh, make some comments on this important work. So I wanna summarize this presentation with three points. First, VIT is a novel anti-PF4 platelet activating disorder that targets, as shown in the Nature paper, the heparin binding region on PF4. So it's special and unique. That high dose IVIG works through competitive inhibition of the FC receptor mediated platelet activation that's caused by the VIT antibody. So it doesn't just raise the platelet count, it helps to cool off the platelet activation, probably also activation on monocytes and neutrophils uh, aspects we didn't have a, a chance to get into. So it really de-escalates the hypercoagulability state. And then finally, you know, VIT's gonna turn out to be a bit of a mini epidemic. You know, it's gonna come and it's gonna go. And at least in Canada, we're probably not going to see it anymore or very much anymore. And so I think the legacy of VIT will be in stimulating greater recognition of the presence of these various anti-PF4 disorders, classic hit, autoimmune hit, spontaneous hit syndrome, et cetera. Uh, and, and this will also help raise awareness of how we treat severe hit. That is, you know, IVIG, you know, most clinicians aren't aware that IVIG is a treatment of severe autoimmune hit. And, and so I think one of the legacies of it will be in, under, in, in enhancing our understanding of, of hit actually, including its severe forms and, uh, and, and, and causing clinicians to be aware of these special treatments like high dose IVIG. So we have about 10 minutes for questions and uh, um, Karen, uh, are you going to be the chair for taking questions? Yes, um, thank you very much. And I do uh, welcome questions. And Dr. Uh, White, do you have a question? And we'll start with Dr. White. Please unmute yourself, identify who the question's for, and we will get started. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Yeah, again, let me echo those thanks. You guys did a fantastic job, a great presentation. So I'm going to start off with you, Ted, and just ask you, uh, your final comment, I think, is really important about, clearly you show the potential benefit of IG, IVIG for VIT and, as you called it, um, you know, autoimmune HIT, but why wouldn't we use it in severe HIT of any cause? Because why wouldn't it be, why wouldn't it be of use in even the severe garden variety heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? Well, I mean, it, it might be. The, the concept with, with, with classic HIT is that when you stop the heparin, which is a you know, general treatment of, of HIT, then the antibodies very quickly lose their ability to activate platelets. And so, and so by giving IVIG, you may not be inhibiting the activation because it should be de-escalating just by the heparin being gone. Heparin's got extremely short half-life, as you know. Right. You Whereas, know that. That's true. But you also know that the that sometimes the, the thrombocytopenia can persist for weeks. But, but, then, but then that's autoimmune hit. So, so, so conceptually, if you have classic hit and you stop the heparin, the plate, the count, you know, rapidly rises, et cetera, then IVIG may not be actually helping. If it's the, the persisting, well then yes, then you likely have these auto antibodies as we call them, the heparin independent. And of course you might not know at the beginning, right? You know, it takes a couple of days to get the SRA back, including the, the nuances of the heparin independent reactivity. In the meantime, you don't know, you know, we're not clairvoyant. You don't know if the platelet count is going to rise or not. So I, so conceptually, sure, if you don't know, maybe it does make sense to give IVIG, but that's my larger point. You know, up to now, we hardly ever have given IVIG to treat HIT. Right. So now, you know, now clinicians... Now maybe we should be considering it a little bit more, especially in people who have a slow plate rise. And my, my second question, and maybe Isaac or uh, you could answer this one, relates to kind of the sweeping statements you've made about the the binding site on PF4 for VIT antibodies based on five cases. How do we know that all of the VIT antibodies bind to the same site? We know that all HIT antibodies don't bind to the same site. Based on five cases, are you sure that they all bind to that site? I don't think so. So right. maybe a little bit of caution as we Move yeah, forward. we made that we made that clear in the paper too. Is that um, 
those are for, and we do. So I, I will uh, say this: we do see variable reactivity in the assay. Some VIT samples do uh, activate in the presence of uh, heparin, but it's not your typical heparin dependence that you see with HIT. Uh, so in HIT, you see two different profiles of activity in the heparin-dependent SRA. In VIT, we see some that can have, you know, a weird heparin, uh, a weird activation in the presence of heparin, and then they activate in PF4. So we're pursuing that right now. We're continuing to screen the VIT samples in the lab to try to identify uh, how much restriction is in the heparin site and how much uh, could be present in, uh, on other sites on PF4. And it could be that we're going to find some that are um, have reactivity to the heparin dependent site because we see some of that reactivity, although the heparin dependent activation does have a profile that is different than the heparin independent or the autoimmune hit. So it is variable reactivity. Uh, those were the first five that we published. Um, and they happen to have the most reactivity in that region. So you're 100 percent correct. Uh, we're, we're, we think that there is going to be more reactivity. Because if they all bound there, then there could be a rationale for using heparin Correct. to interfere with that interaction and not to focus on these non-heparin anticoagulants, which would make our job a lot easier clinically. Right. Thank you very You're much, right. guys. A great talk. Thank you. I might just add one thing to what uh, had said before and while we're waiting for some other questions to come through, um, not only, so it's true that VITs will come and go in Canada, but one thing that we've learned um, doing research in this pandemic is that um, everything has to be a global effort. And, and we are well positioned to do VIT testing uh, for Canada, but we're also positioned to do VIT testing for other countries. And I mentioned this in my segment too, we're collaborating with some folks in Brazil who are struggling with this right now because Brazil, that's their main source of a vaccine. Um, and and I, as I say, I think we're going to get some more samples from them and hopefully help them to uh, uh, sort this through. So VIT is probably gone in Canada, but it's not gone internationally. And uh, this type of research is an international effort. Yes, uh, are there any uh, further questions? Um, I do want to thank um, our speakers and um, uh, Dr. Gabarin and Dr. Patterson for giving everybody a real life picture. I think that that was a, an added uh, benefit. I mean, uh, we, we hear so much about it in the news and I agree with you, Dr. Arnold, that this is an international pandemic and we need to be uh, helping everybody um, in, in any ways that we can um, in, in order to, to get us all through this together. Um, so again, I do thank our speakers, all five of you, <laughs> um, because it was an excellent and it went as smooth as silk. And um, so welcome back to our 2021-2022 sessions. Um, and uh, we look forward to our bi-weekly sessions. And uh, if there are no more questions or comments, Karen, can, I know this is probably the, this is Vinny here. Uh, oh, yeah. Probably not going to be a two minute answer, but uh, <laughs> the vaccines are going to be, I think, much more prevalent. I think we're going to see more vaccines for more things. What, why did this issue happen with the vac that particular vaccine? And is this going to be a problem with other vaccinations? Or similar types of problems and can we predict that in any way? That may be kind of big questions but I think questions that people are asking now. Yeah I'll, I'll give a, a try at the answer to start anyway. Vinny, excellent question and a really important one too. Adenoviral vector vaccines are not going away. These are th This technology is actually quite impressive. It's got lots of uh, added advantages like you know it doesn't have to be stored in a minus 80 freezer, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it has been used in the past for other vaccines like um, Ebola, for example, but never to an extent that such a massive amount of people were given it all at the same time. And so for a rare event to occur, uh, it's possible that it may have been occurring with previous adenoviral vector vaccines, which just never really came to attention. But now that it's on the radar, 
Uh, it's going to be a very big deal moving forward. And to figure out why it happened in the first place, I think is, is still unanswered. Um, and we need to focus on that as we, as we um, learn about new vaccines and, and try to roll these out in the future. But great question, really important. Yeah, and just some comments from my end. There's a paper that's either out or about to come out from uh, Greinacher's group that uh, I think is coming out in blood that looks at some pathogenesis issues. So it appears that components within the vaccine can interact with PF4 to potentially create the antigen. There's the co-inflammatory stimulus, like when you get the vaccine, you, you know, and, and perhaps it's related to all these contaminating human kidney cell proteins, you get inflammation. And so, of course, that doesn't answer why one in 50,000 patients gets it, but it's the same as knee replacement. You know, if you're creating the antigen through knee replacement by, by, the, by the, you know, the surgical material, the debris from the knee replacement, then it gets post-turnkey removal, of the, you get this bolus of antigen. Well, why does one in you know, 100,000 knee replacement patients get it, get it as well? Of course, you have the inflammation with the surgery, et cetera. So the concept may be that you know, the antigen is created, but why does a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion develop it? But that's the problem in HITS. We give heparin at heart surgery to everybody, and only a tiny proportion of patients actually gets the, the drug reaction hit. So it's one thing to form an antigen, you know, what triggers the occasional patient to form the strong antibody? That's like the biggest mystery of all of immunohematology. And if it's just another disorder to add to that long list. Well, on that, um, I will close these rounds. And again, thank all five of our speakers. Um, this was very knowledgeable and a wonderful kickoff to our, our new academic year. And I hope everybody has a great day and weekend. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.